John chapter 4, it's on page 18. This is a first century biography of Jesus. And in a few moments we're going to be looking at it. So, so have it open on page 18. Because here in the story that was so brilliantly read for us, we've got a woman whose world is messy and painful. One broken marriage after another. No doubt she was looking for happiness and fulfillment in marriage. But as we saw, her circumstances are really tragic. And particularly in this, out, in, in this culture, she, she is an outcast, having been married five times and now checked up with guy number six. So did you notice in verse six that she does her, her heavy lifting, her chores, in the midday sun? That's when only mad dogs and Englishmen go out, but perfect for her, because she doesn't want to meet anyone. But Jesus, verse 4, wants to meet her. It says he had to go through Samaria. Now he didn't. No Jew went through Samaria. But what he meant was, there's just something I've got to do. There is somebody I've got to meet. But why is it that we crave peace of mind and personal <coughs> satisfaction? How would an atheism explain that? If you and I are only a bunch of replicating DNA, a, a collection of I don't know, a particle seeking stimulation with a desire for survival. And since sex, food, drink and drugs are the best stimulants, why not just live for gut and groin? Well, Alfie 
says, it's just so empty because I have no peace of mind. Now, of course, it's only the rich and famous who have the opportunity to live like that. So how do they get on? Well, listen to this Sunday Telegraph article on Ruby Wax. It says this. Why does happiness elude so many of us? Ruby Wax has interviewed some of the most privileged, wealthy, and downright appalling people on the planet. Yet she is the first to tell you that happiness, especially among celebrities, is as rare as gold dust. And Russell Brand, in that famous interview with Paxman, said, celebrity tastes like ashes in my mouth. Now, I doubt many of us will get to know what Brand meant by that. You see, it is only the celebrities, isn't it, and the super rich who have the opportunity to try everything. They are on the fast track to dissatisfaction. Whereas, of course, we, we take longer over it. They have the whirlwind romances, the private jets, the house on the beach, while we take the slow route of mortgages, saving up for our dream holiday. But people do get there in the end. My aunt and uncle, my wife's aunt and uncle, rather, they're fabulously wealthy. They go on about four cruises a year, and when they go somewhere nice, they tend to collect houses. And they've got houses in several places, several countries. But they have no peace of mind. We see them at family <coughs> gatherings, see them at wed weddings, and they talk about their money, but they are so unhappy. But where does this longing for peace of mind and inner satisfaction come from? Is it an evolutionary malfunction? Is it just a virus of the mind? But then why can't we eradicate it with corrective therapy? Why does it persist? Why is it that the West is suffering from affluenza, Marie Antoinette's disease, where nothing tastes? You see, there persists in people of all ages, of all times, this deep-rooted intuition that we're more than animals seeking survival, just seeking stimulation. We're longing for so much more. Have you ever looked back to those incredible times in the past where you just felt connected to something bigger? It might have been a long summer holiday as a kid, with the weeks stretching out in front of you, eating till late outside, watching a glorious sunset. Maybe the time you first fell in love. I confess to say one of my amazing moments that I think I'm never going to forget this. I'm just always going to clock this. I'm going to savour this. I confess it was vomiting a fruitcake on a train coming back from Newcastle. It was one of my happiest memories. What am I talking about? I'd just been climbing with my best friend, Frank, and we were travelling from Newcastle back to London. Uh, we, we'd done some great peaks, uh, some great climbs in the Chigots. And uh, I was just re we'd just gobbled a whole fruitcake that was left over from our tuck. And uh, I was desperately trying to make this guy opposite, holding the Financial Times up, laugh. And I was reading these ridiculous extracts from the Spur Book of Map and Compass. And it's not meant to be funny, but it was the most funny document I've ever seen. And eventually it happened. The newspaper began to shake. And the miserable old git put it down, wiped the quiet tears, and then put it back up again. And I thought this was so funny, I vomited the entire fruitcake. <laughs> but it was a great memory. It was a great memory. A good friend of mine has just written his memoirs. Uh, they're, they're soon to, in fact, it's just out. I've been sent an advanced copy. And here's one of his reflections. Peter says about his life as a, uh, an emerging teenager, he says, at the age of 12, I recall a particular episode of reflection. I'd been sent off on one of my father's best ever schemes to spend the eight weeks of the summer with an Italian family to help their son speak English. They just happened to be multimillionaires with a magnificent home in fabulous Portofino on the Italian Riviera, a prestigious apartment in Turin, and a house at the foot of the Matterhorn in the, the Alps. I had to tag along with them between these residences and also join them for their summer holiday. We flew from Milan to Barcelona and boarded a large yacht, which they hired to tour the Balearic Islands for two weeks. My mind now wanders off as I recall those magical days. I remember one evening leaning over the side of the yacht in the warm still air with a pretty Italian girl, 10 years older than me, Together we contemplated life. The clear Mediterranean moonlit sky was reflected in the waters that lapped against the boat. Much of the time we were silent. 
What an extraordinary world this is. So beautiful, so rewarding, so exciting. But what did it all mean? Why does it exist? I had a slow, meandering conversation with this pretty girl. Long pauses, half-finished sentences, more a sense of wonder than anything concrete. Questions were met by other questions, and an overwhelming feeling of how wonderful, and yet how strange life was. Oh, the stuff of memories. <coughs> and ultimately, from Sting's song, we realized that those moments will be lost in time like tears in the rain. C.S. Lewis captures the sting of nostalgia in his paper, The Weight of Glory. He says that we often like to think of those incredible moments that for Peter on the boat with a pretty girl, for me vomiting a fruitcake, or for you falling in love, whatever it is. We tend to see those as the source of happiness. And we're tempted to try and just go back in time, to, to locate them, to hold on to them. <coughs> So Wordsworth wanted to go back to Ashness Bridge. He remembers as a boy, just feeling the sense of wonder as he just dropped pebbles into the water below. But those moments weren't the source of joy. They weren't the source of happiness. They were just signposts pointing to something else. Listen to what Lewis says, and hopefully it will be on the screen behind on PowerPoint. It is the inconsolable secret in each one of you the secret which hurts so much that you take your revenge on it by calling it names like nostalgia and romanticism and adolescence. It is a desire for something that has never actually appeared in our experience. Our commonest expedient is to call it beauty and behave as if that settled the matter. Wordsworth's expedient was to identify it with certain moments in his own past. But all this is a cheat. If Wordsworth had gone back to those moments in the past, he would not have found the thing itself, but only a reminder of it. <clears throat> what he remembered would turn out to be itself a remembering. The books or the music in which we thought the beauty was located will betray us if we trust to them. It was not in them, it only came through them. And what came through them was longing. These things, the beauty, the memory of our own past, are good images of what we really desire. But if they are mistaken for the thing itself, they turn into dumb idols, breaking the hearts of their worshippers. For they are not the thing itself. They are only the scent of a flower we've not found, the echo of a tune we've not heard, news from a country we have never yet visited. You see, one of the problems of living in God's world is that we keep bumping into God's reality. Now contrast what C.S. Lewis has just said with the atheistic worldview of Francis Crick, the great Cambridge Nobel Prize winning scientist, should again appear on the PowerPoint. <coughs> and ask yourself, is this adequate? Is this an adequate view? I'm not saying do we desire it not to be true? But does it have adequacy at the most basic levels? In terms of the explanatory power to explain who you are, the human condition, how inhumans have always felt. You, your joys and sorrows, your memories and ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. <coughs> I think for many secularists, it's very convenient and comforting to feel that we're not accountable to God and that we can create our own meaning. Convenient though it is, it's unlivable, isn't it? And it's totally inadequate. We know intuitively that to be truly happy, to sigh no more, is so much more than chemical stimulation. And we need to follow those signposts of longing and beauty, which ultimately point away from themselves. <coughs> well, the woman in our story is possibly not as promiscuous as Alfie, but she clearly has no peace of mind. Again, we're on page 18 if you've lost your place. No doubt she was full of hope when she first fell in love, probably longed for the perfect wedding, surrounded by best friends, carried off into the sunset. 
But after five failed marriages, she's not even going to go that route again. And as she just picks up this heavy water jar every day in the midday sun, she must have said to herself, oh, I wasn't meant to be like this. On and on, the rain will fall, showing how fragile we are. Well, Jesus wants to meet her. That's why he's gone this route. He knows her need and he wants to meet her. So he deliberately goes through a no-go area because he is going to offer her the peace, the satisfaction, the purpose that she and all of us long for. Now, we need to have our wits about us. If anybody offers us the moon, there are three very important questions you must ask when somebody offers you something. First of all, how much am I valued? You might ask that before starting a romantic relationship. Probably you need to ask these questions before doing anything serious, like, like starting a new job. How much am I valued? Secondly, what's on offer? And then thirdly, who's offering it? And those three questions, we'll see in the next few minutes, get answered for this woman. How much am I valued? What's on offer? Who's offering it? Well, this woman doesn't actually want to meet anyone, let alone some new man offering her the world. She's heard all that before, and her disastrous love life has turned her into an outsider. But Jesus comes to her, verse 7, have a look at that, and says, give me a drink. She's really shocked, verse 9. You're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jews don't associate with Samaritans. Jesus is ignoring 400 years of ridiculously fierce sectarian hatred. It would make Man City, Man United derbies look like they're loving. It really was a terrible scene. And later, when the disciples saw Jesus talking to her, in verse 27, John writes, probably to his shame, what they were thinking. What do you want? And why are you talking to her, Jesus? Jesus knew as soon as they came back, that's what they would say, at least that's what they would think. But Jesus rejects the racist and sexist attitudes of his friends, and he asks her for a drink. He's willing to receive hospitality from the hand of this Samaritan woman. That is remarkable. So why does he do that? Why does he go against convention? Why does he make himself so vulnerable? Quite simply, he loves her, and he values her. But what's the basis of her value? Not her reputation, not her race, certainly not for a Jew. No, Jesus simply sees her as a human being made in God's image. And that gives her a dignity and a worth that transcends all other human estimations of value. And as he looks around this room tonight, which he does by his spirit, and we'll be hearing more about what Jesus came to do and that death wasn't the end over the next two nights, he sees all of you and he loves you with a pure and yet with a fierce love. This is the most wonderful thing. We are of inestimable worth to God, not based on our intelligence or our looks or our class or our race or our religion, but simply because we bear the image of the living God. I wonder if we've taken that on board. I wonder if we realise we don't actually have to think. We have to be more special, keep reinventing ourselves, think we're too dumb. Jesus wants to meet with you tonight just as you are and tell you in no uncertain terms he loves you unconditionally. Are you surprised? Because this woman certainly is. Now here's the important bit and it's in verse 10. When she says, what are you doing asking me for a drink because you're not meant to associate with me? What does she say to her? He says, if only you knew the gift of God and who it is who asks you for a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. So if we need to know how much we're worth to God, we also need to know what's on offer and who's offering it. If we're going to have any confidence that this guy can really deliver. So what's on offer and who's offering it? He's shown he values her, but what's he really offering? Well, if you look down the page, verses 10, 13, 14, Jesus says what's on offer here? is living water, a water that's so satisfying, it takes away thirst, like a, a fresh spring welling up within you. The American poet Elizabeth Barrett Browning wrote, God's gifts put man's best dreams to shame. Drink this, says Jesus pointing to the well. 
you'll thirst again. But if you drink the water I will give you, you will never thirst again. Because we have a God-shaped hole in our lives, in our hearts. It's not money-shaped, it's not sex-shaped, it's not ambition-shaped. It's God-shaped, and it's that big, and it's that shape. Nothing else will do. Johnny Wilkinson, a few years ago, writing in the Times, uh, was speaking of how he felt after winning the Rugby World Cup. Can't really dwell on that, can we? It's ancient history, but I'm going to quote it. You see it behind. The anniversary of that final, the 2003 World Cup, comes around tomorrow, he says, and I find myself in reflective mood. That November evening in Australia may have brought, brought me one of the highest moments of my life so far, but the same experience also triggered one of my all-time lows. Where do you go when you're 24 years old, you've already got what you wanted from life? That night in Sydney, I was searching for the Hollywood film ending to my story, and in a way I got it. You probably know what happened. The close game, extra time, my drop goal, and a 2017 England victory. I remember how I would have done almost anything for the right result before the game. I recall making imaginary packs inside my head in the changing room before the kickoff. The answer to all my dreams was a mere 80 minutes away, and at the time it meant more than life itself for me to secure it. The problem was that in the real world, life goes on after the credits roll. The buzz doesn't last forever. In fact, it confused the hell out of me. One minute I was celebrating the biggest prize in rugby in front of 90,000 spectators. Then before I knew it, I was back in the mundane. The come down sensation can hit hard. Any time you work hard for something, when you invest a great deal of yourself in your ambitions and you succeed, there's room for the expectation that the fulfillment and happiness will always be with you from that moment on. I sat in the same changing room in Sydney after the epic battle until pretty much everyone had left. I didn't want to wave goodbye because I didn't want to let go of the moment and give in to its inevitable passing. I had already begun to feel the elation slipping away during the lap of honour around the field. Or as Gary Jules put it in Mad World that we had so wonderfully uh, sung to us earlier, worn out places, worn out faces, going nowhere. Their tears are filling up their glasses. James Honecker put it like this, life is like an onion. We keep peeling it, looking for the substance, but all we're left with is tears. That sounds a bit dramatic, but we've all experienced that in some depth, sorry. It gets better, guys, it gets better. Maybe when you're at school, you long to get into the sixth form where you could uh, just do the subjects you wanted to. You got there and it's darn hard work. And then you couldn't wait to get to Oxford. Uh, sorry, Nottingham University. <laughs> Forgive my blasphemy. You couldn't wait to get to Nottingham University. And you're here. That's it, isn't it? You've arrived. Can't get any better. Possibly already you're thinking, you know what? I wouldn't mind getting a job and earning some money. And then I can get decent stuff. I can get a nice car. I can perhaps buy a nice home. I can go on great holidays. But when will you find the substance? And how will you know if you find it? Well, I'll marry the right person. I'll, I'll raise a family. I'll, I'll, I'll publish a book. But you know, so many people, like my aunt, my aunt like, well, all of us, really, ultimately, we, we peel away each experience, one after the other, longing for the experience longing for the substance and just wipe away the tears of frustration and disappointment with the other. This onion-like nature of life is something she's experienced. What's it all about? Five failed marriages, she's not going to go that route again. She's not allowing herself to hope in case she becomes hurt, disillusioned again. And Jesus says to her, if only you knew the gift of God, if only you knew who it is who asked you for a drink, you would ask him, and he would give you living water, the thing you most need and want. Now the thing we're meant to notice here is that Jesus appeals unashamedly to desire. If only you knew what was on offer. If only you knew the gift. Now, her problem isn't too much desire. The Stoic or the Buddhist would say, oh yeah, her problem is she's you know, just been chasing after men, looking for one experience after another. Jesus actually says to a woman with a seemingly insatiable appetite for men, your problem is your desire is too small. If only you knew what was really on offer, you would ask. 
and I would give to you. And that might be true for many of us here. The beer and circuses of student life, the easy sexual conquest, end the sport, drink. Maybe you're just too easily satisfied. The chance to end frozen on blue rain. <laughs> I mean, can it not get any better than that? <laughs> Listen to what C.S. Lewis says again, again on the PowerPoint. God finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We're half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. We're like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what's meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. So Jesus says, look, you need sufficient imagination and desire so that when you realize what's on offer and discover who's offering it, you would ask him and he would give you living water that, that would satisfy that inconsolable longing. This is where all those signposts point. Those moments you look back to, they don't have to be tears dissolving in the rain. They're pointing to an ultimate reality. And Jesus says, it's to him and all that he offers. Now, maybe you don't desire because... You just don't want to get hurt. Maybe you've bought into the so-called postmodern cynicism. Satisfied with being dissatisfied. Do everything in life with an ironic wink and then you won't get hurt. But that's not how we've been made. We're meant to have an inconsolable longing. We're meant to yearn for meaning, satisfaction and beauty. And if only we knew what was on offer and who was offering, we would ask and we would receive. Unless Jesus is a liar. God wants you to be happy. He made you for himself and he desires you to be happy. He wants you to be freed from the consequences of, of your ingratitude and your rebellion towards him. An attitude that separates us now from true happiness of knowing him and for eternity. And God has a gift. And I suppose the real question is, do you desire it? Do you know what it is? And will you desire it when you know and so he tells her again what he can offer her, living water, a water so satisfying, verse 14, 13 and 14, it takes away thirst like a fresh spring welling up inside you. She still refuses to, to, to believe he can deliver and gets even more sarcastic. Do you notice that? Verse 15, oh please sir, give me some of that water, then I'll never be thirsty again, I won't have to keep coming here to hold water. She didn't imagine for one minute she wouldn't have to get water from the well. It's almost as if she's saying, isn't my life hard enough without all this fancy talk? I'm an outcast. You know who I am. Why are you taunting me? <coughs> she's cautious. Men have offered her the moon before. You know, many of the students I speak to, I've got five kids myself, three, well, two have been through uni, one's at uni, two are about, one's about hopefully to come here. Uh, I meet students all over the place, and one of the things I find when I chat about God and Jesus is they're often afraid to, to commit because they've been hurt, because they've been let down. It might have been mum or dad who promised you security, and then they walked walk out on you. And it's quite a common thing for that to happen when one of you or your siblings uh, first goes to university. So we shouldn't be surprised, should we, at her defence strategy. She is afraid of being hurt again. Anyway, Jesus isn't distracted. He's not giving up on her. So he cuts through her mild sarcasm in verse 16 with this simple request. Go and get your husband. Now up to now, Jesus has been very gentle. Once he suddenly becomes so intrusive, well, he has to. He really has to. She's trying to keep him at arm's length. We too can convince ourselves that the, the, the root of our dissatisfaction is just circumstantial. Oh, if only I'd been given a different set of gifts or looks or background or, or parents, then my life would have been totally different. Our real problem, according to Jesus, is ourselves. And that's what Jesus is pointing out to her. We're at odds with ourselves because we're at odds with God. Go get your husband. That's the thing that symbolised the unravelling of her life. She was just disastrous in love. She just kept messing up. We're out of sorts with each other, with ourselves, because we're out of sorts with God. And Jesus puts his finger on this visible symptom of that 
broken relationship, go get your husband. That's the only way God can cut through our rehearsed, I don't know, go away Jesus, I'll think about you another time. He puts his finger on it. What it would be with us, I don't know. <coughs> well, this plucky and intelligent woman, she's not done yet, is she? She pulls out what she thinks is going to be her trump card. Did you notice verses 19 and 20? Have a look at those. Essentially, the question is, which religion is right, Jews or Samaritans? This place of worship or that? It's a great tactic, by the way. If you think, you know, this whole Christianity thing is getting a bit too close for comfort, just pop in one of those questions. What about other religions? Jesus won't be distracted, though. And he basically says to her in verse 24, this whole thing is not about names and places. It's all about spiritual reality and truth. And now she walks into her own trap, verse 25. She says, oh, I know that Messiah, when he comes, the one who's called Christ, when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. What a shame. We don't have the knowledge now. We don't have the time. Uh, it's been really nice talking to you. Well, maybe when the Messiah comes, you know, somewhere over the rainbow, then, then we'll have the answer. Verse 26. So you're walking to the punch. I who speak to you am he. The hairs would be standing up on the back of her neck. This isn't an enigmatic stranger doing a chat-up routine. This is God in human form, her maker. The one who knows all about her life, who loves her unconditionally. He's standing in front of her. So the value he places on her life, they're not empty words. The offer of eternal life welling up within, that's not some, some highfalutin promise that you might deliver if you're trying to chat up a girl. God in Jesus is walking on his own planet, looking for worshippers, verse 23. Those who worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, this is what this woman does now, verse 28. The woman left her water jar beside the well and went back to the village and told everyone, come see a man who told me I thing I ever did. And she sort of probably wants to stay there with Jesus, but she thinks, I'm not keeping this to myself. Everybody's got to hear about this. This is amazing. Messiah has finally come. Come on, everybody. Come and see him. So he reveals who he is by speaking into her life. And maybe some of the things that have been said tonight are just totally on the money for you. You might think, well, it's almost as if what's been said and sung is was just for me. Well, if that's the case, can I suggest that is probably God, by his spirit, speaking to you. Don't ignore that voice. You don't always hear it. But if you are hearing that, if you are hearing that clarion voice of Jesus speaking to you, then listen, he says, if only you knew the gift of God, who was offering it, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. Don't carry on endlessly peeling the onion, wondering where satisfaction will come from. Well, this woman trusted Jesus. So did all the men of the town, you can read later. They didn't yet know how he was going to be the saviour of the world, but they knew he was. But do you know what? After two days, Jesus had to leave. Think, why would he do that? Well, he had to go to Jerusalem. Why did he have to go to Jerusalem? Because that's where he was going to die. He had to leave Samaria and go to Jerusalem. Ultimately, that was the place where he would die. And he would thirst in the midday sun, not by a Samaritan well, but on a cross. Mary, did you know, the child you delivered will soon deliver you? The only way Jesus could deliver on that promise of taking away thirst was to thirst himself and to die in agony on a cross. This woman, like us, needs forgiveness as well as acceptance. She wasn't just a victim. She'd also caused hurt, no doubt, in those relationships and to others. We are not just victims. We have offended God greatly by the way we've lived in his world. And Jesus went to a cross, not just for her, but for you. The one who was delivered of a woman went to deliver every woman and man on this planet. Well, we're going to look at that astonishing event tomorrow night. But I just want us, as we finish, to just see what is on offer. This astonishing gift of forgiveness, a restored relationship with the God who made us, to understand for what we were made. I've used the 
Augustine quoted a number of times already, he said the great African uh, bishop from the fourth century, he says, we were made for God and our hearts are restless until they find rest in him. It's very striking in verse 28, she leaves the one thing that symbolized her empty, repetitive life at the feet of Jesus. She leaves it at Jesus' feet. In a stranger, she saw someone who valued her. But then, as God in human form, she sees someone who can offer her eternal life. She leaves the water jar, she follows him, and calls all the men of the town, and publicly says, this is the saviour of the world. Well, are you willing to leave everything at Jesus' feet? Your own selfish ambitions, just going in your way? Because there is a pearl of great price. If you would leave the trinkets, what is on offer is of eternal value. And it will satisfy. And you will never thirst again. We're going to listen to the song, if you were here last night, that Ruth Levy Floyd sang, uh, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And it's really only as you reflect on how Jesus <coughs> delivers on this offer of eternal life. But I think you can really come to terms with whether you're ready to make that step that she did of leaving what she was clinging onto at his feet and accepting him and all he offers. So let's just be quiet for a moment. Uh, Ruth and the band are going to come back. She'll sing. Just reflect on what's been said. And then I'll just round off with a few seconds of explanation right at the end. And there'll be more a cappello and I think more, excuse me, more food. So let's just listen quietly.
waking wow, up wow, wow, to wow, ash wow, and dust. Wow, wow, I wipe my wow, brow wow, wow, and I sweat wow, my breast. Wow, wow, I'm breathing wow, in wow, the chemicals. Wow, 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 wow. Some of the songs you heard here, and hopefully a bunch more as well. That is on Sunday the 6th of March. It's a half fate, and it is in the studio, which is the new venue just near the side of Portland, near Thank you very much. Hopefully see some of you soon.